Have you enjoyed the presence of the Lord so far? Yes. It's awesome. Um, we're going to have Sam come up here and share a little bit. I didn't know if she would, and she said, yeah, I will. So She got in this morning about 2.30. <laughs> so Julie and I are a little tired. You, know, you parents know what it's like. When she gets in and gets in her room, like, okay, now I can go to bed. <laughs> you know. So come on up here. She's going to do good. Come on, help her out. Ladies and gentlemen, Samantha Stevens. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Let me pull up my notes here because I will get lost. I know me. You're All fine. Right. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so most of you know I went to Asbury this weekend for the revival. Um, we got there um, around 6. Or no, we left around 6. We got there at midnight. Um, we drove by the chapel and like we saw the people waiting to get inside and um, we could hear the music through the car and you could just feel the power of it just from the car. Um, so I was really excited to get inside. Um, we got inside the chapel around midnight and didn't leave until two in the morning. Um, but the time went by so fast in there. We were in the chapel for about an hour and a half and it felt like 15 minutes. Um, it gave us all a little taste of heaven because there's no sense of time there and also it's been, and that's very hard to comprehend, comprehend, but now I can understand it a little bit easier because um, you just lose all track of time when you're worshiping. Um, for the second day, we were in the chapel for two and a half hours, um, and it was very, very hard to leave, but that felt like 30 minutes. Um, so the second day, we were very close to the chapel, and we were worshiping all together in line, and when we could hear what was going on inside because they had a like big screen, like kind of like an overflow kind of lot where they, um, people who weren't in line, they were worshiping. And um, so the person speaking asked if we could pray um, for and with the people around us. So we all got in a circle in line and we prayed with the people around us. Um, but my favorite part of my whole experience at Asbury was um, the person talking asked if we could kneel on the ground and just praise the Lord and um, also just have some quiet prayer time. And there was just something so amazing about seeing everyone um, on the ground praying. It was very emotional. Um, it was the most quiet I've ever heard outside. Like, there wasn't a bird chirping or anything. All I could hear was the wind, and no one was talking. It was just so quiet and peaceful. Um, I had to open my f eyes a few times to make sure I wasn't alone. That's how quiet it was. Um, I couldn't even tell there was people around me. Um, we were freezing cold outside. It was like 30 degrees. Um, but I still got sunburnt, as you can see. <laughs> um, but uh, when we knelt down on the ground, that was the one time during the whole day where I was like warm. Like the wind was blowing, but it was still so warm on the ground. For, and that you would think that's the coldest place, but it was um, so warm. And then as soon as we stood back up, we began to shiver again. It was crazy. Um, so my time at Asbury was very special. Um, when you walked into the room, you could just feel, feel the peace and joy immediately. Um, when I started worshiping, I just felt connected with everyone. Um, and that's what I imagine heaven is like. Like, no strangers, you just automatically know everybody. I felt like there was nobody that I didn't know in there. Um, you could also just physically feel the love that Jesus has for all of us in there. It just, you could feel the love he has for everybody else and for yourself. Um, but it really reminded me of my home here at Freedom Life. Um, I think that's what like, drew so many people to Asbury, is they want to experience um, that freedom of letting the Holy Spirit move. And uh, we waited 10 hours in line <laughs> to worship uh, the Lord and worship while we waited to get in. But I'm just so grateful I get to experience that every week at my church. <laughs> All right, you want to get into the Word for a little bit? Yes. All right. Hebrews 8, 6, go ahead and stand. I have a lot to cover today. I'm going to try to get it all in here. Hebrews chapter 8. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, and as much as he is also mediator of a what? 
better covenant which was established on better promises. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. Oh, thank you, Lord. Father, we're excited to get into your word today. We pray that you would speak to each heart that's in this room. I know some of us are tired. <laughs> Lord, we ask for divine energy today. Sharpen our minds, Father. We just thank you. Speak to our spirits. I want you to take a moment and say, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 You can be seated. We'll see how far we get through this today. What I want to show you is something that many people are struggling with, and many don't even know that they are struggling. So even as I talk to pastors and leaders, I see where they're getting these two areas confused. Now, I don't want to sound like I have it all figured out, because I really don't. So I'm just going to show you what the Word of God says. Is that cool? So what we're doing at the beginning of this year is we're reinforcing the foundation of the gospel of grace, and what we're going to look at today, we haven't talked about for three years. So for some of you, this might be new. That means we're growing. Somebody say amen. amen. And some of us, it might be refresher. But this is important. Let's read this again. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So if Jesus is our mediator, our go-between, and this new covenant is a better covenant, then I want to know all about it, all right? Don't you? The first thing that I want you to notice is that it doesn't say established on better commands or better rules. It says what? Better promises. So if this new covenant is indeed established on better promises, then I want, I want to know what they are. I need to know and understand this new covenant and how it works. And I talk about it a lot. Hosea 4, 6, my people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. So I want to know. Amen. How many want to know? You want to know what's in there? All right. So let's go to John chapter 8. 31 and 32, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the what? Truth. The truth, and the truth shall make you free. So I want, I want you to look closely at what Jesus is saying. If you abide in my word, number one, you're my disciples. A disciple, a follower of Christ, abides in the word of God. How many love the word of God? That's what we do every Sunday, right? We get into it, we abide in it, delight in it. It means to take pleasure in it. And then he says, you shall know the truth. How does law enforcement know how to spot a counterfeit $100 bill? They know the real one. They don't study the counterfeit. They study the real one. Once you know the real deal, you don't have to study the counterfeit because it automatically gets exposed. Once you know the truth here, you can spot a lie. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't study evil to be able to spot the lie. I study truth. And when evil presents itself, I know that's, that's not of the Lord. Are you with me? That's why we have to abide in the word of God. And with him. Number three, the truth shall make you free once you know the truth. Here's what I want you to see. You have to know the truth first in order for it to make you free. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So my assignment as your pastor is to present the truth of God's word to you. Now here's how to tell if you're receiving real truth. Does the truth... Does the gospel, the preaching, the ministry that you're receiving, is it leading you into freedom? Is it making you free? Or is it leading you into bondage? Some of us in the past years have been led into bondage with the ministry. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So I have to know the truth of God's word. So if I'm being taught truth, I'm going to be free in every area. Somebody say amen. Are you getting it? So good. The truth of God's word should always lead you into freedom, should make you free. Not freedom to sin, freedom from sin. If I leave church every week focused on me and my behavior, that will never make me free. If I come to church and I'm taught to be sin conscious more than I'm taught to be forgiveness conscious, I'll never be free. I've talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I'm bound by sin because all I thought about when I, from the moment I went up till I went to bed, I come to church, sin, 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 sin. That's not living a life of freedom. Somebody say amen. amen. Romans 3 in the New Living tra Translation. Chapter 3, 23 through 25. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his what? Grace. Grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Verse 25. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they what? Believe. When they start going to church. No. 
When they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood, the sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. Under the law, we had to work to be righteous. Under grace, we have to believe. It's pretty clear, right? Romans 10.10. 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice it says believe unto righteousness. It doesn't say work unto righteousness, behave unto righteousness, perform unto righteousness. This is the truth that makes you free. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, this is where religious people get upset. They say, are you saying that we don't have to live right anymore? I'm saying that the good works and right behavior are a direct result of right believing. Amen. That's what I'm saying. The right believing comes first, and then I live right. Then I do right. It starts with my believing. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. I don't work unto righteousness. I don't act unto righteousness. I don't, are you with me? Everybody say believe. believe. But the church wants to focus on the right doing first, and it's out of order. All right, let's put this slide up there, the next one. The law says stop sinning so you'll be righteous. Grace says I'm righteous so I'll stop sinning. Amen. Give the Lord praise on that one right there. Amen? This is so good. The law says stop sinning so you'll be righteous. How many have come to church and heard that? Grace says... Joe, you've been made righteous, so don't do that anymore. Amen. I know who I am. We just talked about it during worship, right? When you know who you are, God has declared over me that I'm righteous. That's not who I am. Somebody say amen real loud. Amen. The problem with that kind of teaching, if we hear stop sinning first and then you'll be made righteous, the problem with that is they're teaching the law. Can we go a little bit deeper? You guys doing all right? Yeah. Hebrews 8, 6. But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant. Jesus is the go-between. He's the mediator, which was established on better promises. Now verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Not according to the covenant. Not according to the old. Are you with me? Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now verse 13. In that he says a what? A, say it real loud. New covenant. New covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This means that there are some people who are teaching something that is obsolete. If you're teaching stop sinning first so that you'll be made righteous, you're teaching something that's obsolete. It's obsolete and out of date because of the dispensation that we're in. We're in the grace dispensation from the cross to the rapture. We're living in grace. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Everything changed at the cross. Hebrews 7. I'm moving kind of quickly because we're running out of time, but I want, you to, I want you to really get this. For on the one hand, there is an, an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope. Everybody say better hope. Better hope, better hope through which we draw near to God. We have a better hope, and it's called grace. Through this better hope, we can draw near to God. The law points to our sin. Grace points to Jesus. Yes. Isn't that awesome? The gospel of grace will always take you closer to Jesus. It has nothing to do with you. It's all about him. That's why religious people fight this hard, because they want their part to play in this. They're proud of their performance and their behavior. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The New Living Translation says a good worker who correctly explains the word of truth. So what happens when we don't rightly divide the word of truth? What happens if we receive bad teaching? Could a portion of the church be living like Jesus never went to the cross? Could we be suffering for lack of knowledge or being destroyed for lack of knowledge? With grace, we're learning that there are requirements before the cross and requirements after the cross. But what if we get those mixed up? So let's get into it. Are you ready? <laughs> Reach over, put your seatbelt on, because we're going to be moving. Can you do that? Just do it. Because <laughs> I want to get through this today. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 3. Everybody say, here we go. Here we go. Now, 
Now shall come to pass if you diligently. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> now shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you what? Obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. And it goes on and on. So we see that if you obey, if you keep the commandments first, God will bless second. Now we're going to jump down to verse 15, Deuteronomy 28. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Back up to the second line. If you do not obey, if you, so it's on you. If you do not obey first, you're subject to the curse second. In both cases, your performance and behavior determines what you receive. What you did first determined what God did second. But here's the issue. That was before the cross. Galatians chapter 3. 13 and 14. Christ has what? Redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, through our believing. You and I get to receive the blessing of Abraham simply because we're in the family of God. The, we talked about this years ago. The Abrahamic covenant is not based upon your behavior you're blessed because you're part of that family. Amen? You're part of the family of God. So here's what I want you to see. After the cross, the blessing comes to you because of what Jesus did first. Before the cross, it was what you did first determines what comes second. After the cross, what Jesus did first, now I'm blessed second. Somebody say amen. amen. So important. Romans 5.19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. As by one man's disobedience, the sin of Adam, it came in, many were made sinners. We've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We're in the prison of sin, right? It's not based upon your actions. You're born into it, right? So also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Jesus living a perfect sinless life, dying on the cross, being obedient first now enables me to be obedient second. One man's obedience, many will be made righteous. My righteousness is not based upon me and my behavior. It's based upon what Jesus did at the cross and the resurrection. It's all about Jesus. Amen? Amen. So what happened at the cross? The order changed. It's no longer what I do first determines what God does second. It's what Jesus did first through his death and resurrection that now empowers me to do second. I couldn't be righteous first. I couldn't be holy and pure and blameless. It's what he did first that empowers me to do second. Everybody shout, that's grace. That's grace. So now what we need to do is rightly divide the word of truth. Because we can't just reach in and pull a scripture out and say, that was good, let's go home. All right? We can't do that. If this is truth, what I'm telling you today, then we need to back it up with the word of God. You interpret scripture with scripture. Amen? Somebody say amen real loud. Amen. amen. Matthew 19. Now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, eternal life, keep the commandments. Now this is where we see people begin to get messed up. Jesus is answering him based upon the requirements before the cross. He said, if you want eternal life, in other words, if you want to go to heaven, you have to keep the commandments. He's saying, if you want eternal life second, then the first thing that you have to do is keep the commandments first. Everybody got it? This is what we have to understand. Jesus was still operating as a prophet in the dispensation of time before the cross. He is the Son of God. He's God in the flesh, but he was operating as a prophet. He had to teach the law. Are you with me? So at this time, this dispensation, the correct answer was, if you want eternal life, you have to keep the commandments. So that's before the cross. Let's go to Acts 16, 30 through 34. Did everybody get that? 
And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were were in his house. Verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes immediately. He and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. This is so good. So before the cross, you had to keep the commandments in order to receive eternal life. But after the cross, because of what Jesus did first, all you have to do is believe second. It's what Jesus did first that now empowers you. All right, let's back up to verse 30. I went through that quickly, but I want you to get this. This is after the cross. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, what? Believe. They didn't say, keep the commandments. Why? We're on the other side of the cross. Amen. Everybody say, believe. believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. I want to be very clear. He says, if your household believes, they'll be saved too. He's not saying, if you're saved, your household's covered. Right? right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and it's good for your house if they believe too. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all. They all believed. Isn't that awesome? So before the cross, you had to keep the commandments in order to receive eternal life. But after the cross, because of what Jesus did first, all you have to do is believe second. He did all the work. It's what Jesus did first that enables us to do second. This is important for us to understand, or people will say, well, Jesus said it. It's red letters in there. He said, you've got to keep all the commandments. He also said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Let's form a line down here in front. <laughs> If your hand causes you to steal, cut it off. Next week we'd come back. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Clap your stumps together. <laughs> right? Well, it's red letters, Joe. <laughs> Are you with me? So we have to know before the cross and after the cross. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> you like that one, didn't you? <laughs> All right. Here's a big one. Mark 11, 25 and 26. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I've had pastors tell me this. If a person doesn't forgive, they're not going to heaven. Then that means my salvation is based upon me. Grace has provided everything for you, Joe. But if you don't forgive, you're not going. Well, now it's back on me. Are you getting it? If you believe that, you've just set aside the grace of God, put all the responsibility back on that person. You've just mixed law and grace. Galatians 2.21, this will make it pretty clear, very clear. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, through my actions, through my behavior, Christ died in vain. Amen. If I'm forgiven because I forgive you, then why do I need Jesus? I need him because I might be struggling in that area of my life. Amen. Somebody say amen real loud. Amen. You're getting it, aren't you? As long as Jesus was still walking on the earth, before he went to the cross, the old covenant was still valid. That's why he's teaching this. But after the cross and the grace dispensation, it's not legal for me to teach this to you. But yet I have pastors who tell me that. Joe, you have to forgive or you're not going to be forgiven. You need to tell your people that. Well, I'm not teaching that. <laughs> right? It's law and grace mixed. Are you getting it? Joe, you've been saved by grace. You're on your way to heaven. But if you have a little bit of unforgiveness, you're not going to go. And you're like, whoa, now it's back on me again and my behavior. Are you, you're getting it, right? Yeah. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Again, we see the pattern of the old covenant. We see man forgiving first, and then God forgives second. Why? Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. So what does forgiveness look like after the cross? Look at your neighbor and say, this, this is about to get really good. <laughs> Colossians three thirteen. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you first, 
so you also must do. The forgiveness came to me first, and if he can forgive a sinner like me and the mess and the people that I've hurt, if he can forgive me, I can forgive you. Why? The forgiveness came first. What he did through the cross and the resurrection now empowers me to forgive second. It's not based upon my performance, but it empowers me now. Does that make sense? Look, I should never say this is good today. Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. He forgave you first, now empowers me to forgive. Second. Again, we see the forgiveness coming toward me first, empowers me to forgive second. This goes for people who can't forgive themselves, because that happens. Jesus has empowered you to forgive yourself because he's forgiven you. And if he can forgive me for the things I've done, I can forgive myself, right? So we've looked at salvation, we've looked at forgiveness, but this has to work in every area of life for it to be valid. So let's look at love. Mark Mark chapter 12. You guys enjoying this? This is good. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So can we be real in here today? Do you really love God with all of your heart? Don't answer. Don't answer. <laughs> that, might, that may be a trick question. Is there love in your heart for your parents? Maybe your grandparents? For your kids, for your pastor. You ought to say amen right there. I'm teasing you. So how can we say we love God with all of our heart? Who could, if we're being honest, who could really love like this? 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first, now I can love second. You see in the pattern, is it becoming clear? We love him because he first loved us. What Jesus did at the cross and through the resurrection now empowers me to love on a level I couldn't before. He loved me in my sin. He loved me when I was rejecting him, when I was hurting him, speaking against him maybe even, right? He loved me in my mess. And when I see that, man, I can love my enemy. I can love the one who's out to get me because now if I'm close enough to him, I see through his eyes what he saw when he looked at me. And now empowers me. But here's what I want you to get. What he did first empowers me to love second. Isn't that, that's good. Oh, amen, Joe. Keep going, brother. <laughs> so we've looked at salvation, forgiveness, love. What about the area of giving? And you guys brought this up last week, so we'll look at this really briefly. 2 Corinthians 9, 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So do I give first and then God gives second? No. He gives first so that I can give second. He provides the seed to the sower. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. He gives first so that now I can give second. He doesn't say, now you're in the family of God, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come in, now start giving me the money. He says, I'm gonna give you the seed so that you can plant it in good soil. We talked about it last week, right? Why? After the cross. He says, I'm not even expecting you to come up with your own seed. As small as the seed is, he says, I'm going to give you this seed to plant. But your job now is to turn loose of it, right? We went all through that last week. So what I want you to see is this is after the cross. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower, he supplies it first so that I can now give second. So with what we've looked at today, we see that this is true for salvation forgiveness, love, and even in the area of giving. God is not waiting on you to act so he can act. He isn't waiting on you to be good so that he can be good. He's just good. After the cross, what he did first now empowers you to do second. You don't have to perform and behave in order to get God to act. He's already acted first. And when I understand that he's declared that I'm righteous, now I live like it. Second. Are you getting it? Do you believe that what I showed you today is 100% truth? Yes. It's the real deal, 100% authentic, right? Yes. Then when anyone tries to tell you that receiving anything from God is based upon your behavior, now you know the truth. You know the truth so you can spot the counterfeit. 
you know the truth and that truth will make you free. Anytime that anybody comes in and says, Joe, you're not going to go to heaven because you're not forgiving. I say, whoa, whoa, that was before the cross. Now, when I understand that what Jesus did, he forgave me, and now it empowers me. But what I, what I want you to see is anytime that someone tries to put it back on your behavior, your performance, your actions, it's the law. It's before the cross. Because they will say, it's red letters, but I showed you today what he was teaching. Did you get it? Yes. It's so important. This is for grown folks. Somebody say amen. amen. Go ahead and stand. Are you free this morning? Yes. We made it. It's a privilege to minister in this church. As you guys get it, you really get it. It's amazing.